I'm happy to be here with you. I'm Pastor Louis, the Fulton Campus Pastor, and it's my honor just to be here with you today and be able to serve in this capacity. Today I get to deliver a message to you. Come on, I'm excited about that. You can go ahead and be seated. I'll get you standing in just a second. But um, yeah, I'm super excited for that as today we actually start a new series as well. So um, that's going to be good. And, um, you know, so tell your neighbor, it's going to be good. <laughs> but uh, today I believe I have a word for you. But before I even get into that, honor is just a core value here in our house. And we just let's honor our lead pastors. Just, you know, they, we've had an amazing Easter. We had an amazing year. God is doing some tremendous things. We're in the middle of escrow and the church is growing and it has been growing since it started in the house to where it's at now, to where we're heading in, in uh, Anaheim and to the multi-campus church that we're at. So let's give them a praise for some awesome leaders or give God praise for some awesome leaders that we have. Awesome pastors that believe in us. Come on, are leading the charge. We're taking territory and we're seeing families get saved. We saw our, we experience salvation. We experience God's best in our life because of their leadership. So we honor them. Honor my wife and my children. They're around here. My wife's over here looking beautiful as she always is. And uh, I'm up here and I represent our family. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I can't do what I do without them. And they can't do what they do without us or out me it, it just it's just that's just how it works in family can I get amen how many families out there a lot out there and y'all know the support you need from your family to do what you do whether it be in ministry or just in the workplace or as an entrepreneur or if you're a college student in a family and going to college it just it takes the family so um, it's it's important to honor that and I want to honor you for being here and saying I want to be better be better you come, become better. Every Sunday you come to church, you become better. Can I get an amen? I hope you believe that because it's the truth. It's not something you just check off the box and say, I came on this Sunday. I came this many times out of the year. My New Year's resolutions was to come half of the Sundays. So I was like, no. Like when you get here, it's not about just checking that off. That stuff is great to measure your, your, your progress, but, but this is growth. This is you getting better. This is God pulling out that, what pastor uses the term, which I love that he uses, the redemptive potential that's inside you to see God's best for your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, yeah, you can give God a praise for that. God's best is coming out of you, church. I don't know if y'all believe it, though, or it just might be that y'all just haven't had your coffee yet. <laughs> But uh, today we start a new series called Growing in Faith, and I'm excited because I, I believe I have a tool to share with you that I have learned that has taken me the entirety of just being here at Freedom House Church and uh, uh, to understand, and even um, I still use now. So it's not something that I put down, it's something that I use because, like I said, it's a tool. Uh, you know, tools are great, especially if they're power tools, but, you know, what, what, what use is a power tool if you, never, if you don't know how to use it? You don't know how to use the power behind it. Can I get Amen. There's power behind the tools that we, we're giving out each Sunday to you all. Uh, today, I'm giving you a tool, and there's power behind it that you're going to use to help you grow in your faith and, and build you in faith. So we're going to jump into uh, some scriptures right now, and I'm going to take you back to the Easter story. And last week we had Easter. I feel like it was so long ago, but let's just give God praise for what he did on Easter. Over 250 salvations. Come on, somebody. Packed out services record-breaking attendance which is pretty neat it's pretty awesome and so many people getting saved across all campuses and y'all did it we all did it in the rain come on somebody it was pouring rain give it up for the welcome team that was outside in the rain holding umbrellas for you welcoming you in come on we love the welcome team and all the dream team that was here without them we couldn't produce what we produce here which is an atmosphere just to encounter god so we're going to go back into the Easter story, but we're not going to go from the beginning. We're going to go like at the end, right where, where Jesus, um, Jesus is on the cross. He's about to die. And then um, to a point of resurrection where he reveals himself to his disciples, uh, that's where we're going to go. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. So we're going to go there. I'm going to set you up just a little bit, just a little bit from uh, my notes that I want to share. But we're going to go to that part of the scripture and we're going to see how we can use this tool that I'm about to share with you to grow in faith, grow in your faith walk with God. And we're at the spot where he's about to die. He's on the cross. Jesus is about to die. We know that reading the scriptures, his death was necessary so that we can have salvation. Y'all thank him for the salvation we have in Christ, the freedom we have in Christ. It could not be possible without the work of the cross. So we know that. We know that. But at the time, the people around him, uh, his disciples were probably wondering if it was truly necessary. I know, Jesus, you've been talking about this, 
we maybe don't even understand it. Actually, not maybe. We don't understand it because that's what it says in the book of Mark that Jesus spoke to them of what was going to happen, but they didn't understand it. And they're probably wondering, like, does it really need to happen? Does it really need to take place? Because if they're with Jesus, man, they're living the life. Like, they're seeing the miracles. They're seeing all these things. They know that their faith in Jesus has been lifted up so high because he's a, he's a miracle worker. He's the ultimate healer. He's the, the water walker. He's the storm calmer. I mean, he's the one that produces miracles. Miracles. He is the one that cast out demons. He is, he is the one. So they're wondering, does he really need to go to the cross? Does he really need to die up there? But yet they're seeing it in front of their eyes. And they're seeing Jesus on the cross. And he's dying up there on the cross. The Bible says this in Hebrews 11.1. 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now faith and I bring this up because this is a point that I do want to make. Faith is only active when it's demonstrated outside of what your reality is. It's not active with what you see. You don't need faith to know that I'm up here because you see it. Now, if I wasn't up here, you'd be like, you have to have a lot of faith to believe that I'm up here and I'm somewhere else. Um, but, 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 but faith is only active when, you, when it doesn't match up with your reality. It's something that you don't see. So what's your reality right now? That's the question I want to ask you. What are you facing right now in your life? What is it that you're doing? Maybe you came here to, to uh, Freedom House um, last week, Easter. Like, who's this guy? I met Pastor Sai last time. Why is he up there? And, you know, now I'm back and this is the guy up there. Um, I want to let you know if that's you, you came here last week, you just started coming to Freedom House or you just started watching online. I was in the same position you were. I came to Freedom House and I was in a position where like, okay, I, want, I wanted... I wanted to see I wanted to see more in my life, but my reality wasn't wasn't really showing it. I wanted my marriage to be fixed. I wanted my marriage to be put together, but the reality was that is we were always fighting and we we're throwing around the, the word divorce constantly. And I, I was in that seat. I was in that seat, you know, 16 years ago and, and wondering and never never thought that this was where I would be. Now, I say that not because I think maybe 16 years from now, maybe you will be in the same place I am where you're preaching up here. But it could be true. It might not be true. But maybe there's something else that's for you that God has for you that you don't quite see yet because your reality is not, it's not there yet. There's too much turmoil, too many mountains to climb. There's a valley you've been walking through for quite some time. There's, there's just, you know, not really, I just don't, I just don't see it. But that's when faith works. Is when you, you don't, what, what you, reality doesn't match up with what you don't see. It, it's where it works. So faith works when you don't see it. It doesn't work when you're seeing it. Amen? Your faith is for what you don't see. For the disciples, the reality was Jesus dying on the cross, and now there was a space in between. In between his death and resurrection that required them to lean into their faith. Everything that they learned from Jesus, they'd have to lean into it. So we're going to read uh, uh, right now where Jesus is at, uh, said, the, the, uh, said his last words before dying on the cross. And then we're going to jump forward to what the disciples were doing in between the time, um, that time and the resurrection and when he was reappearing to people. So I'm going to invite you all to stand to your feet as just it's the uh, custom in our house to honor God's word uh, as we read it. And I'm going to read after, out of John chapter uh, 19 verse 30. And it reads like this. Somebody say the Bible says. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So he makes a statement, Jesus, even Jesus said it is finished. So you got to imagine, what are the people who had faith in Jesus and all that he saw, Peter and all the disciples, John, all the disciples, Mary, his mother, all, all of them, what did they think when he said it is finished? When he said he was coming to bring his kingdom and now he's saying it is finished and he died. That's what they're left with. That's the lasting memory of what's going on. Man, we're supposed to be hey, just, just living the life. Jesus was to lead us all into freedom. And, and he says it is finished and then he dies. Now he's dead. We know that he resurrected. Amen. Now we're going to read some scriptures where he, he resurrected to his disciples. Now if some of you were here for First Wednesday, how many of y'all were here for First Wednesday? Come on somebody. Was that good or what? Pastor Brian always brings a word. And I want to let you know, I'm going to read you the same scriptures that he read. 
we didn't t- we didn't we didn't talk about it so this is something the holy spirit wanted us to preach on to you know him on on his vantage point and in mine on this and yeah i was even sitting over there it's like man he's he's doing the same scriptures that i'm gonna do on sunday and i even told myself maybe i should it but the holy spirit quickened me and said nope that's what you're preaching so he's all right people want to hear it or people need to hear it i should say god then let me give it so i'm gonna give us this is a word i'm telling you this is a word so let's read these scriptures and i'll jump into more John chapter 21, verses 1 through 8 says, Later later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. So half of the disciples are there, including Peter. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing, gone fishing. You ever seen those signs say, gone fishing? I think this is where they got it from. I'm going fishing. They got it from Simon Peter. We'll come too, they'll, they'll say, they said. They all followed him. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because he, there was so many fish in it. Then the disciples Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. That's kind of backwards, huh? You, normally, you, when you jump into the water, you know, today we just have a shorts or whatever. And this guy puts on his clothes to get into the water. I always thought that was interesting. Make note of that because I will reference that at the end of the message. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. The title of my message is called Interpreting the Silent. Interpreting the Silent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word. Thank you that it's already anointed and there's not much I got to do to it other than speak it, Lord. So I pray, Father, that as as it's being spoken, Father, it falls in the soft hearts of your people. May it grow their faith, Father God, and may it be something that is used, Father God, Lord, uh, uh, day in and day out to help them interpret the moments, Father God, where they feel that are silent to them, Lord Jesus. May they grow. May they be blessed from it, Father. And may you change lives today, Father God. And may hearts be turned towards you, Lord. Speak through me. I am your vessel, Father God. I'm your mouthpiece. Not my will, but your will in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Okay, go ahead. You can all be seated. Give a neighbor a high five if you want to do that. Come on. Has anyone ever learned a new language? I'll raise my hand. I've learned a new language. How, how many have you learned a language and then forgot it? <laughs> that seems to happen a lot, especially if you're, you know, in high school, you learn a different language. I'm in Spanish class. I was in four, you know, Spanish one, two, three, four, and I, I forgot everything, right? Um, you, you learn these things. Uh, you learn, you're learning Spanish. You understand that there's a lot of, or, or French or whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of intricacies to, 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 to a language and learning a language. Um, there's a lot of things that, that, you try to figure out and when translating language too. I know when for our, our church, when we're putting things together with, uh, with English and then we have our es- like English conferences and then we have our Espanol conferences, some things get translated. But then we find out like, mm, that's not the best translation. We go, Pastor Luis, can you check this out? He checks it out. Uh, that's not what it actually means. Because <laughs> the meaning behind how it's translated is not necessarily how it's portrayed when it is Put into Google Translate. Can I get an amen? Google Translate is great. Duolingo app, that's awesome. Rosetta Stone, the new one, App Babel, all these things to learn and, and to teach you how to translate and, and, or, or speak a different language are, are great. But sometimes things can get lost in the translation. Because a lot of the times what you translate is not necessarily what you're meaning to say. So though you're translating it, the interpretation might be wrong. Because translation and interpretation are two different things. Translation is just interpreting word for word or, uh, or changing one language from uh, one language uh, to another language word for word. And interpretation is the meaning behind what you're saying. Kind of ha- like a text. Can I get amen? <laughs> yeah, like you send a text. Well, he didn't send in a smiley emoji with that. So why do you say it like that? Or, or how, where are all my married men out here? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Have you ever walked around wondering why she's silent? Hey, <laughs> you're like, uh, I better interpret this silence well here, I'm, you know, because uh, <laughs> if I don't, I'm going to be in big trouble. Come on, somebody. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. Am I connecting with you guys this morning? The wife said, amen. <laughs> they also say, you better get it right. <laughs> and so that's, that's you know, you, you, you get all these things this, this, from translating, interpreting, and, and interpreting something such as silence is, is something that you wouldn't think needs interpreting. But it truly does. Because there's moments in our lives where we find ourselves uh, needing to interpret what God is doing when we don't hear his voice. Can I get an amen? The disciples were in that place. They didn't know they were in that place, but they were in that place because they, the reason sometimes you don't know you're in that place is because you got so many things going on because life doesn't stop because God went silent on you. And just because God went silent on, me, on you doesn't mean he doesn't care about you. Life may be going on. You may be having some bills that you need to pay. You may be needing to, to get some health care because you got some health things going on. You may be needing to, to you know, get your marriage together because some things are going on. Life's still going on, but you, you know God has a promise for you, but sometimes there's a silence there. And the disciples were in a spot where things were silent, but just life was going crazy. Things were going crazy, and they're trying to figure out what to do. Though he died, they knew the, what he said, that he was going to resurrect. They still were not, in my, if I was me, I would not be believing what I was seeing. I was like, why does he need to die? I mean, life is good with him here on earth. <clears throat> there were humans just like you and me, so their thoughts wandered as well. They knew he was the son of God. They knew he was the savior of the world, but he is dead now. That's what their reality was. Now there's an opportunity for the faith to step in, but the reality was that he was dead. Now they are in a, a left in a space where so much is going on in the world, but Jesus is silent in their life. God is silent in their life. They knew the promise, but he was silent. Persecution was going on, but he was silent. They knew he was the savior of the world, but he was silent. They knew that they were being scattered all over the world, but he was silent. This is the space that I believe we find ourselves in more as believers than anything else. We know the promise, but yet we're going through life. The in-between, the silent. When we feel like we're walking with Jesus in step with God, and then we just feel lost on the way to our breakthrough, our miracle. I know the promise, but he is silent. I lost my job, but he is silent. I know he's the God of the impossible, but he's silent. I'm walking in sickness, but he is silent. I'm still addicted, but he is silent. I don't know if I'm supposed to be in this relationship, but he is silent. I'm a single mom trying to raise men of God, but he is silent. My wife and I are trying to have children, but he is silent. I know he is my hope and my salvation, but he is silent. Let me tell you this, church, it's in the silent places we can misinterpret the, pur misinterpret the purpose and meaning of what God is saying. It is I'm telling you, church, it has taken me all my time here at Freedom House to, to, to do this, understand this, bring language to this. Because there are moments where I've walked through this and I, didn't, I never had the language for it, but I, I, I knew, I knew what I was doing. I knew how to interpret the silent. I think one of the greatest compliments that I've ever received was not too long ago where they said, uh, uh, well, this person told me, Louie, you just know how to interpret the silent. And when he told me that, it's like a light bulb went off. And I was like, wow. In the silence is when we get lost. In the silence, we can be misdirected. In the silence of God, we can, we can lose our sight of God. It's in this place that we find ourselves many times that, that if we misinterpret it incorrectly, we'll find ourselves going down the wrong path find us, ourselves giving purpose to something that was never made to have purpose for. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he's not at work. The disciples knew that he, he, he died on the cross and he was silent for a moment, but it didn't mean he was not at work. We read the scriptures, we know he was at work. He resurrected. God's silence is not a lack of clarity, church. God's silence is not a lack of clarity. It's actually... It's confirmation to hold on to what he's already spoken and done. Because when you can't hear God, then you got to lean on what God already told you, what God already did, and hold on to that and lean on to that to move you forward. Amen? 
Peter had so much, and Peter and the disciples had so much that Jesus had spoken to them, so many things that he did around them, and so many things that he did for them, that, that, but yet they still misinterpreted the silence. So it's, it's, it's not something that, you know, you can get correct all the time. It's something that you can get correct most of the time if you follow certain steps, which I'm going to share with you in just a second. But they, they misinterpreted the silence. Even they, Peter, the one that, that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church upon you, misinterpreted this. Jesus died. They were told the resurrection was coming, and they went back to their old way of living. They misinterpreted by going back to what they were doing. And not only that, it was actually, it was actually Peter, the one who the God was going to build the church on. Jesus spoke to him. He's the one that went back. The Bible says in verse 3 in chapter 21 that Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And then it went on to say that when I will come to, two points that I want to make here when it comes to misinterpreting the silence. Is the comfort of your emotions will cause you to misinterpret the silent moments in your life. Sometimes we blame it on our flesh, but it's not our flesh. It's the comfort of our emotions because our emotions can get comfortable in certain spaces that our flesh will just follow along. Peter went back to what he was emotionally comfortable with. What are you emotionally comfortable with, church? What things are you emotionally comfortable with that you feel settled in doing because that's just your emotional comfort? Not your flesh, but your emotions. I think our flesh gets a little bit more uh, cop out or, or blame than it needs. But I really truly believe it's the flesh that follows just the emotional comforts in our, in, that we have inside of us that leads us to the things that we're not supposed to be in. Or doing the things that, uh, that, that God doesn't want us doing. Whatever it is, whatever your emotional comfort is, I want to give you some, some, some wisdom here. Set boundaries around it so you don't misinterpret what God is doing in your life. Set boundaries around that. Point number two that I want to bring from the scripture is, is this. So when you misinterpret the moments of silence that God gives you, you will lead people in the wrong direction that are around you. So Peter, so Peter went fishing. Who followed him? Five other disciples. That's half of the disciples. Because he got emotionally comfortable and misinterpreted the silent, and then he went back to his old way of, of doing things. But not only that, he took others with them. There's people that are attached to you that if you misinterpret the silence that you're in, that will follow you and you will lead them down a path that they shouldn't be going down either. You got to take responsibility, church, for the silence and you got to be comfortable, I guess, in the silence. It's, it's uncomfortable being there. I know we say in church silence is awkward. So whenever we have silence moments, it's like something happens. There's no music. There's no piano. There's, the video goes down. It's very awkward. I know some of you have been a part of those moments. Like silence is awkward. We don't like that. We always try to fill in the space of silence. It's in between these moments, in these silent moments, the silent moments that give your faith room to grow, though. So the silence is necessary because if there wasn't, the, if, there, if God was always there, you would never have the faith to grow because you know that he's always going to be there. And you know they're sure that he's there with you, but I mean like show up for you. Like, but, but there's a moment where you gotta, God wants you to step out in faith and act on beyond, beyond what you see in your life. But he can't do it if you're, if you're just always just seeing him show up all the time, all the time, all the time. He needs your faith to grow. That's why there's certain spaces that he creates so that your faith can grow, so that you can grow in areas of your faith. Him being silent in your life is him not, not loving you anymore, him not caring for you anymore, him not thinking about you anymore. No, it's the opposite. It's him loving you to the fullest because he wants you to grow. Amen? He wants you to grow. It's taken me all of my time here at Freedom House to understand this space. This necessary space so that my faith can grow. So you might be wondering, okay, well, talk to us. How, how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, I got some things here for you that I want to share with you in the last few minutes of my time that will equip you to interpret the silent. So I'm going to go to point number one. You guys ready? Is this helpful? Is this building you guys up? All right. Here we go. When you are in the silent, walk in holiness. When you are in the silent, walk in holiness. 1 Peter 1.6. This is Peter. Come on, somebody. I love Peter. He's such a great example of being human. (laughs) 
and following Jesus. Come on. It is written, he says, be holy because I'm holy. He was quoting God in the scriptures, the Old Testament. Be holy because I'm holy. Holy means being set apart. Holiness keeps you, okay, holiness keeps you ready to hear from God again. So when you're in the silent moments, yes, it's, we're, we're looking to hear from God. We're looking to get direction from God. We don't want to force it, but at the same time, we got to be ready for it. And when you keep yourself holy, it keeps you ready to hear from God again. Because sin will do the opposite. Sin and God do not mix. It's like oil and water. They just don't mix. You can't live a sinful life thinking that you're going to hear from God because sin and God just don't mix. You got to maintain your holiness. You got to maintain who you are as a believer, as a Christian, and stand on your biblical principles and lead your life that way in order so that you can be ready to hear from God again. Can I get an amen? 1 John 3, 5 through 6, the Bible says, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Sin keeps you from knowing God's voice. One scripture tells you that if you have sin in your life, you don't know him. The other one tells them you know his voice, you know him. Jesus and, 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 and sin, they don't mix at all. So you got to maintain your holiness when you're in the space of just being silent. And what does that mean that sin, sometimes you can think of the bad things. I don't murder. I don't steal. It could be gossip. It could be slander. It could be different things. It could be laziness because laziness is a sin. Uh, it, it could be something that God told you to do but you're not doing, which is disobedience, which is also a sin. Those things, so it's, it's, I know when we talk about sin, we, talk, we go off to the deep end, like murder and all, all those crazy things. And, 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 but, but it's also the little things, the little foxes that spoil the garden, spoil the vine. And my wife says, amen. Come on. She's been quoting that scripture this past week. So, um, <laughs> Number two, number two, number two. These things are what have I learned to interpret the silent well. Number two, number one was when you are in the silent walk in holiness. Number two, you must guard your heart in the silent moments with God. You must guard your heart in the silent moments with God. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, somebody say above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do for, that you do in your life flows from your heart. So the Bible tells us to guard our heart. When we are in the silent moments of God, it's, it's super important that you guard your heart above all else because whatever you do is going to flow from it. And if you're wandering, if you're trying to figure things out, if you're trying to, trying to or allowing other things in, I should say, if you're allowing other things in and allowing uh, your, 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 your advice from this person who doesn't even follow God or that person on your marriage who's not even married, you're allowing things in, it, it will lead you in the wrong direction, it's Especially where you're in the in-between moment. From where God is taking you from glory to glory. You're in that two moment. You will misinterpret everything if you do not receive uh, or guard your heart appropriately. Amen? you got to guard your heart above all else because everything comes from it. An impure heart always misinterprets what God is doing. Just because God is silent, again, I'm going to say this again, doesn't mean he's not at work. Guard your heart because when you don't guard your heart, you'll start thinking he's not at work. An impure heart will lead you to believe you need to make, take matters into your own hands, usurping how God is handling it in his. Point number three, point number three. When in the silent, hold on to what God has spoken to you. Come on, somebody. When in the silent, hold on to what God has spoken to you. How many of you got a word from God? I'm going to raise my hand. Audience participation. Raise your hand if you got a word from God. You've gotten a word. Every Sunday you guys get a word. Come on, somebody. Some of you are lucky enough to get a word from the man of God who lays his hand on you and prophesies. But God's giving you a word. He's giving you a word. He's giving you a word through his, his, his word. Hold on to that word. But you got to hold on to what God has spoken to you. Isaiah 58, 50, I'm sorry, 55, 11 says this. It is this. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So when God gives you a word, you hold on to it because no matter what, even though your reality, you don't see it, it will produce fruit. 
it will prosper, it will come to fruition because it's God's word. It's not your word, it's not my word. My word will fail, your word will fail, but God's word never fails and never returns void. So you hold on to it. When you are in the silent, you hold on to it. That's how you interpret the silent well. That's how you interpret those moments so that you don't lose faith, so that you continue growing in faith, walking in faith, and building your faith. You hold on to what God has already spoken to you. Because this is what happens when you start looking for the next word. Because it, it happens. You start looking for the next word. You say, oh, man, I don't hear God. God, I just need a word. I need a word. I hear that all the time. I need a word. I need another word. I'll say it myself sometimes, too, so I'm going to throw myself in that bucket. But when you start looking, constantly looking for a word, you'll end up first forcing any word on you. That's the danger. So you got to hold on to the word that God has already spoken to you. Because if not, the more and more you look, the more and more you're forced. It's easy to get impatient in this space with God and lose faith. The impatience will lead you down the wrong path. For Peter, going back to his old way of doing was the wrong path. I imagine he got impatient too. And it, wasn't, it was only a few days for him. It wasn't too long. It wasn't a long time. But yet, his reality was that Jesus died. He knew he was supposed to resurrect, but he didn't see it. So he, he probably just got impatient trying to force something on himself. So, well, I'm just going to go back to doing what I'm doing. I'm emotionally comfortable, and then I'm just going to get back to that. I, I guess that's what I should do. He said, he said be fishers of men, but fisher men, uh, that's kind of close. Let's go back to it. I don't know, but I imagine he got impatient, led him down the wrong path. Maybe your impatience has led you back da- down the path that you were never meant to go, supposed to go to, just like Peter. I've been in that situation before. I'm not up here thinking I'm, I'm, I'm holier than thou, but, uh, but I've been on that path before where I've gone, I've been impatient, I've gone the wrong way. I believe in Peter's impatience. He probably was trying to get understanding, so it was well-intentioned. He was trying to get understanding of it all, get clarity on what Jesus had already given clarity to him for, but, but he needed more. He wanted another word. I say this with love. Because, you know, as a pastor, like I said, I hear many things. But stop using the excuse of seeking clarity from God to enable your impatience with him. Stop using the excuse of seeking clarity from God to enable your patience with him. In my years at Freedom House, I've seen so many people look, look for clarity to only be led astray because they, don't, they didn't know how to interpret the silent moments with God. They walk around looking for confirmations. They get a word from God, but need words to confirm it. They go from one pastor to the next, from one leader to the next, one person to the next, until they get a word that suits them, a word that fits them and their emotional comfort. This usually happens when things get hard, and in in the hard times, they, they end up ignoring what God said to them. So they're looking, they're looking, they're looking for a word. They're looking for a word. So they, they, they jump from one church to the other. They go from one campus to the other. They go from job to job because it's always the job's fault. They stay with their boyfriend or girlfriend when they know the Holy Spirit said no. They get into a business deal they should have never walked into, they should have walked away from. They do so many things, and you can fill in the blank. Those are just a few things, and I'm sure some things are going through your head right now, but these things, you start looking for emotional comfort and security because you're looking for confirmation from a, for a word that God already gave you. But in, And so you start forcing it, and you accept any word that comes on you. All these things, along with others that I didn't mention, will get, ena- will get enabled when you use the excuse of seeking clarity for your impatience with God. When you're constantly looking for a word, you will end up forcing any word on you. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. And I'm here just to, like I said, to encourage you guys. I, I mean, this is stuff that I, I'm telling you. I, I took me all my time here at Freedom House to learn and under- or understand, I should say. That's a better word. It's still something that I use today because there's silent moments that I just don't, I don't get. But I know what to do. These are things I do. I have one more point for you, and we're going to close up in just a second. And this is the most important part about the silent. Because if you don't get this, actually, it's all important. <laughs> but to me, it's one of my favorite ones. Because if you don't get this, then you'll definitely misinterpret the silent moments in your life. When, the, when in the silent, think the best of God. 
When in the silent, think the best of God. Think the best of God because he thinks the best of you. When you don't hear from him, it's very easy to think like God forgot about you. God doesn't care about you. He's abandoned you. I've felt all those feelings before. It's very easy to think that, that he's turned his back on you. It's very easy to think that he wants you to suffer. God doesn't want you to suffer. God wants you to live in freedom. And then you start getting this pessimistic view of just who God is in your life. And you get these negative things. Like, and, you, and you take on persecution like it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a championship belt. Like, yeah, I'm the persecuted. Like, these things, you start thinking the worst even the worst of God at times. But the truth is, God thinks the best of you. And you being in a silent moment, in the in-between moment, where the Bible says he takes us from glory to glory, you, you, you think that that's God turning his back on you, but it's not. you got to constantly maintain the discipline to know that God has the best in mind for you. Best in mind for you. Amen? I'm going to read you these scriptures because I want to show you the best. And there's even more, but these are just the ones that I selected. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. What is that? That is God's best for your life. He didn't just say that just so that he can stop it. No, God doesn't work that way. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago so that we can do the good things long ago so this was a plan just like jeremiah 29 11 talks about plan god has a plan he even says it in this you are a masterpiece because he thinks the best of you you're not just uh, half put together you're not part put together you're not refurbished no you are brand spanking new you are beautiful and he wants the best for your life psalm 139 says this um it says for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You are fearfully and wonderful made, wonderfully made. He made you to be wonderful. That's, that's God's best. You got to understand that God wants his best for you. And you got to think of God uh, at, at his best whenever you're in those silent moments. Because this is who you are. God does not make trash. You're not trash. I know like the lingo that kids like to use a lot. You're not trash. Come on, rebuke that from anybody who tries to send that your way. But, but you are God's best. That's what you are. Turn to three people, tell them you are God's best. And I'm going to read you the scripture that I said already, but I'm going to read it here. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we will all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just by the spirit of the Lord. Glory to glory, that's God's best. Peter and the disciples were stuck in between that, glory to glory. The resurrection was, was here, he was coming, he was reappearing, but there were also, also was a death. Did you all know that the Bible references the death of Jesus Christ as a glorious death? Come on, somebody. So there's some things that just need to die in your life that may seem to have some of your emotional mourning to it, but that is glorious to God because he's going to take you on the way to the next glory. Did you all know that? Some of us think that glory to glory is supposed to be breakthrough to breakthrough. And, and breakthrough is sometimes death to certain things that need to happen in your life. Glorious death, that is. Glory to glory, the Bible says. There's a best to best that God takes you from. The silent moment is not indicative of how God wants to work in your life. It's just indicative of the space he's creating so that you grow in your faith in him in your life. So that you grow into the person that you need to be in your life. So that redemptive potential comes out in your life. Philippians 1.6 6 says this. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. There's a work that has been started in you. There's a work that has been started in you. And some of you in here think that that work is done. Or you think that the work is incomplete. Because you haven't heard. Because you're in that silent moment and you just don't know how to interpret it. We have interpretation for everything else. We have uh, apps to translate things, but we just, we don't really have apps to interpret. Interpret 
it, it, that, that's more relational. You cannot interpret what God is doing till you are fully in relationship with him and in intimacy with him. But if you turn your back on him, and maybe it wasn't even intentional, but you've gone to the wrong places in this silent moment, it's caused you to misinterpret everything that God is trying to do in your life. The way you come back to that is through a relationship. You get back to those things. You get back to what I said and what I showed you. There's so many things that I, that, that I had a list of things, but I had to break it down because, I, I mean, I'm, talk, I'm talking to you something that it took me 16 years, been with Freedom House 16 years to, to understand. But these things that I shared with you, I know will feed your faith, will grow your faith, and cause you to interpret those silent moments, which are more than the breakthrough, the breakthrough moments in your life so that you continue on that road of, the, of, of, of just seeing blessing in your life, seeing God work in your life, and seeing yourself grow in your life. You're not finished, you're not finished, you're not finished. God has, has a work that he's doing with you. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, because I, I, just, I just feel the Holy Spirit right now, so I'm just going to pray right now. Um, if you're in here and this is you, like, man, I've been misinterpreting my silent moments. Or let me say it like this and be real with it. I feel like God abandoned me. I feel like God turned his back on me. I feel like he forgot about me. I feel like he doesn't love me anymore. I feel like, you know, I'm just on, alone online. If that's you, I want to pray for you because this, this message was for you so that you can interpret that moment, so that you can interpret the, this in-between moment that you're in, so that you stay on the path that God wants you. And so if that's you on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Go ahead, raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Hands going up all over the place. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody just put your hands out. I'm going to pray, especially those that raise their hand. I'm just, first and foremost, I just want to say God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He cares for you, and he wants to see his best in you. There's nothing you can do that keep you, to keep you from him wanting to see his best in you and come out of you. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for the word that you gave. I thank you, Father, for these moments. They're hard moments. They're difficult moments. I'm not saying they're easy, Lord, because they were never easy for me. They still aren't easy, Father. But I do know what to do now, Father, in those moments. And, and sometimes still I get it wrong, Father. But I pray this morning the tools that you've given to me, Lord, that you give to your people. May they internalize it. May they use it so that they interpret the silent in the right way. And to see the silent not as, as, as something bad or something wrong, but also as something as a blessing, Father, because you're creating margin and space for our faith to grow, Lord, to, to believe for the things that what our reality uh, does not show, to believe beyond that and see, Lord, you at work. I pray, Father God, you give them a... a, a uh, an interpretation even right now, Lord, just an, an affirmation of, of just what you're doing in their life. Lord, that you love them, that you care about them, that you shape them, that you form them. Lord, give them that, that, that right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be tangible, may it be present, and may they fill them to the overflow in this moment. Thank you for each and every single one of them, Father. I pray a faith, their faith grow, Lord, to the overflow. May their faith carry them forward to what's next, Lord. And may they go through these silent moments with strength, leaning on the Holy Ghost, leaning on the Holy Spirit, walking in holiness, Father. Walking, Father God, after you, chasing after you, Lord. Holding on to the words that you've spoken to them. Thinking the best, Father God, of you in these moments, Father. Not abandoning you, not going from, from one word to the other word. Looking for what's emotionally comforting for them, Father God. But seeking the words seeking your presence father lord and waiting for what's next jesus that you have for them may they may they do that with with an obedience may they do that with a discipline may they do that father god with an earnestness may it draw up not a frustration of 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 them wanting to find something to to eliminate it but may it be a divine frustration telling them that they're in the right spot they're in the needed place because you are forming them you are shaping them you are chipping away at them father and and bringing them into the person that they need to be into the image of your son jesus christ 
Holy Spirit, fill them, give them the power to walk in this, to walk in it as they move forward. 